Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to the fact this, that this event is being live captioned. When the captions begin, you can access them in the menu at the bottom of your screen. My name is Catherine Romero Santos. I'm an assistant professor of English and the co-director of the Humanities Collective here at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. We are an interdisciplinary organization that fosters humanistic learning and enables meaningful action through programming that supports the scholarship of humanities faculty and students, engages partners on campus and in the community to advance the public humanities, and calls attention to the relevance and the urgency of the humanities in contemporary society. If you don't already, we encourage you to follow us on social media at Humanities TU. I would like to thank my Humanities Collective colleagues, Tim O'Sullivan and Ruben Dupertuis for their leadership and support. And I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to our program assistant, Heather Eichling, and our student worker, Kenneth Leisk, for all of their amazing work on the logistics and promotion of this event. We're also grateful to Jonathan Hill in ITS. Tonight's lecture is part of a series of public events linked to a seminar that I am currently teaching on the topic of Shakespeare and race. In this course, my students and I are investigating the formation of racial thinking and racialized identities in the period during which Shakespeare lived and in the afterlives of his plays on page, stage, and screen. The purpose of this event series is to extend these conversations beyond our classroom and into the various communities and publics with whom we interact and intersect. If you are interested in this multifaceted topic of Shakespeare and race, I encourage you to visit the Humanities Collective website for a list of open access and free resources. There you will find articles, podcasts, and videos generated by scholars, teachers and artists whose work engages these questions from a wide range of perspectives. I would also be delighted to hear from you if you have questions or ideas for collaboration. We are incredibly lucky to have a leading voice in the field of pre-modern critical race studies and an innovator in the field of Shakespearean adaptation and appropriation studies with us here tonight. Dr. Vanessa Guadalera is an associate professor and chair of the Department of English at Andrews University. Her research, which has been published in many of our field's leading journals, focuses on race and representation, both in early modernity and in the era's depictions in contemporary popular culture and performance. She has written incisive and field-shifting articles on cultural artifacts that range from plays to podcasts and from films to comics. Indeed, her work is a true model of what is possible when we think about Shakespeare and issues of race and gender from boldly cross-historical, intermedial, and transdisciplinary perspectives. Her eagerly anticipated monograph entitled Speak of Me As I Am, a Fellow in Post-Racial America is forthcoming from Edinburgh University Press. This book investigates the way representations of race and gender in quote unquote post-racial American Othellos undertake either anti-Black or anti-racist ideological work. We are so fortunate to get a preview from that book tonight. Dr. Corradera's lecture will be followed by a question and answer session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any point during the lecture in the designated Q&A box by clicking on the Q&A icon in the designated um, icon you see at the bottom of the Zoom window. Thank you again for sharing your time with us this evening. I will now th turn things over to Dr. Coravira.
Sorry for that awkward silence. I had to share the screen, which messed up all the settings we had so carefully established before we started. Thank you so much to Trinity for inviting me. Thank you to Dr. Bomero Santos for organizing and for everyone as well who has helped me with this piece. I'm incredibly grateful, um, especially my students who were the first ones to encourage me to watch Get Out because I am a big scaredy cat and uh, and terrified of horror films. Uh, and so before I formally begin, I would just like to say that I hope that we leave tonight not just thinking about Shakespeare as much as I love to think about Shakespeare, um, but also about the power dynamics informing the stories we engage with across culture. And so without further ado, on 27 April 2016, actor David Tennant appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert for an interview during which Colbert inquired, why do you think Shakespeare is still so resonant with us today? Tennant observed that Shakespeare speaks to a universal human condition. Similar language characterized a range of 2016 promotional materials for celebrations of the 400th anniversary of the Bard's death with words and phrases like lasting legacy, relevance, timeless and international appeal recurring. These are claims for a universal Shakespeare. Appeals to univer Shakespeare's universality are not solely the provenance of celebratory promotions or late night repartee. Harold Bloom famously credits Shakespeare with intervening with inventing personality and claims that Shakespeare is a more adequate representer of the universe of fact than anyone else. Kiernan Ryan has more recently reconsidered Shakespeare's universal appeal. He argues that problems with claims to universality lie with what he calls the, quote, conservative construction, end quote, which fails to account for Shakespeare's use, quote, to make class, society, patriarchy, racial divisions, and colonial domination vanish behind the smokescreen of the eternal human predicament his drama allegedly reflects, end quote. Instead, Ryan calls for attention to what he terms Shakespeare's universal human potential, the potential of human beings beings then and now to base their lives together on values that possess universal validity because they are founded on the simple irrefutable fact that we belong to the same species. Other scholars remind us to be wary about such claims. Ayanna Thompson turns to the film Suture and Bringing Down the House, which she argues depict differing visions of Shakespearean universality that erase culture differences, that overlooks whiteness's tendency to appropriate, and that ignores how whiteness ensures its cultural exclusivity. Peter Erickson and Kim F. Hall similarly contend that, quote, one of the major challenges is considering the vulnerabilities and limitations that universality glosses over. Part of the discussion concerns the prospect that Shakespeare's work cannot always adequately address current issues of racism and racial ju justice, end quote. Indeed, as Patricia A. Cahill and Kim F. Hall note, quote, terms like genius and universality are too often codes for white dominance, end quote. And Brandy K. Adams contends, quote, more often than not, the lens through which we are asked to consider these plays is that of a white cisgender able-bodied man who often vociferously insists that he embodies the universal interpretive mode for all conversations about Shakespeare, end quote. Assertions of universality thus ignore Shakespeare's potential to function as an alienating entity, a shibboleth for approved high culture, often tacitly imagined as white. Indeed, in the West, the term universal undoubtedly carries with it the weight of racial distinction not easily shaken off. Akhil Mbembe explains that monocolored Europe or the West reserves for itself the status of quote, the decisive site of being. That is what makes it universal. Its meanings being valid unconditionally in all places, in all times, independently of all language, all history, indeed of any condition whatsoever, end quote. Making whites universal, Richard Dyer explains, rests on the ability to co-committantly make whiteness the human norm so that other people are raced. We, he says, meaning white people, are just people. By positioning themselves as the norm, white people can, quote, claim to speak for the commonality of humanity, and quote, in a way that raced people cannot, for whites have the privilege of not representing any particular interests. Dyer thus asserts, quote, there is no more powerful position than that of being just human, end quote. Significantly, maintaining this position of power depends on hiding its constructed nature by achieving invisibility through a control of perspective. 
quote, perspective places the individual spectator as the addressee of an image and yet keeps him or her out of the image. We are the spatially privileged observer who is nonetheless not in the picture, he elaborates. According to Dyer, it is the white male gaze that most often shapes the dominant perspective, both within the world of film and without it. Put differently, white people position themselves as normal, human, and therefore universal in opposition to the othered, raised, particular non-white individual. As such, claims of Shakespearean universality often carry with them the presumption of white universality. The weaving together of whiteness's cultural dominance, Shakespeare's cultural authority, and the construction of a perspective that strives to mute attention to this very dominance raises the question, how do we combat white universality via Shakespeare or otherwise, especially when it attempts to erase traces of its supremacy? I propose to you that at least one answer is a reorientation of perspective, one that values the particular over the universal. Jordan Peele's film, Get Out, models for us precisely how to achieve this undertaking. Indeed, its monetary success and wide ranging cultural impact provide a potent corrective to assertions that audiences only desire universal, i.e. white stories. This is a lesson from which people who continue to turn to and stage Shakespeare's Othello could learn. Get Out and Othello share a number of narrative overlaps, yet one, Get Out, is a story that brings to the fore racial subjugation, while the other, Othello, is, as Keith Hamilton Cobb recently explained, always being told through white lenses. Without the burden of this white lens, Get Out illustrates how a similar story in which a black man ultimately strangles his white female lover, though admittedly not to death, becomes one that explores two key facets that would provide powerful frameworks for adapters, teachers, and scholars of Othello, namely white supremacy's necropolitics and the psychological toll of microaggressions. Applying the framework of the coagula to Othello in this way would, I contend, help it likewise become a story that implicates white complicity in anti-Black oppression. But beyond Shakespeare, Get Out potently demonstrates the importance of challenging the white universal perspective by insisting on a space for the particular diverse storytelling so long silenced across mediums. Before addressing Get Out and Othello, I want to continue to put just a little more pressure on the ties between universality, whiteness, and representation. Significantly, because whiteness gets to be universal, everyone else must be different in some particular way. Yet that particularity gets erased in order to create narratives that serve whiteness's ideals. Chef and author Eddie Huang recalls how, despite the semi-autobiographical sitcom Fresh Off the Boat being a, quote, very specific narrative about specific moments in my life, end quote, the network, he means ABC, wanted to, quote, tell a universal, ambiguous cornstarch story about Asian Americans resembling Mugu Gai Pan, end quote. Meaning, for example, that the titular character, Eddie himself, was not allowed to be depicted disliking the quintessential American dish, macaroni and cheese, despite what happened in Huang's actual life. In The Guardian, Lily Loughborough even more specifically identifies the overarching perspective prioritized in television and film as, quote, white cis masculinity, arguing that this positionality is one with the authority to shape the universal we, a we by which culture sets the standard for what counts as both widely applicable and aesthetically valuable storytelling. In other words, by privileging the white male gaze, storytelling across mediums narrows the type of narratives deemed acceptable for wide or universal audience appeal. As a result, stories by and focusing on women as well by and about persons of color, particularly black indigenous persons of color are relegated to the margins if told at all. Shifting this white male perspective is not easily enacted because of the power white men hold across entertainment and arts industries. Take Hollywood as one example. The cold, hard, discouraging facts indicate a very minimal response to calls for increased diversity concerning entertainment content and creative control. Remember, Oscar's so white. In an article for the New York Times, Maya Salam reports that a recent study from the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism found that, quote, of the top 100 films each year from 2007 to 2017, that's 1,100 films in total, representations of women, people of color, LGBTQ people, and the disabled has remained overwhelmingly stagnant, end quote. 
concerning gender, quote, women have never accounted for more than 33% of speaking roles in a given year, end quote. The numbers regarding racial and ethnic diversity are likewise abysmal, with white characters making up 70.7% of the characters pictured. These numbers only tell the story in front of the camera. Salam explains that only 43 women directed films during this period. An article by USC Annenberg provides more details noting, quote, women of color were almost absent from these ranks with just three black or African-American females and one Asian female in the director's chair. Overall, directors from underrepresented racial groups fared poorly. Only 5.5% of the 886 directors examined were black or African-American and 2.8% were Asian or Asian-American, end quote. Hollywood therefore serves as a useful microcosm exemplifying how recognizing white supremacy's grip on cultural objects and the stories they tell may be easily recognized, but it demands repeating for this grip proves difficult to dislodge. This contextualization of universal as a stand-in for whiteness and the perspectival commitments this dynamic insists upon helps contextualize the weight the term universal holds when applied to Shakespeare. While Universal carries racialized ideological burdens, even within the narrow world of Shakespeare studies, it bears even more when considered in light of what the word symbolizes in American culture at large. Get Out challenges this white universalism, offering up lenses and tools that can be compellingly deployed to reconceptualize Othello by emphasizing white supremacy's necropolitics and the justified paranoia caused by microaggressions. Writer and director Jordan Peele's 27 breakout horror thriller was an unmitigated success. Made on a $4.5 million budget, the film has gone on to commercial and critical acclaim, making $254.3 million and garnering four Academy Award nominations and one win for Best Adapted Screenplay. The film's genre, horror, made this recognition especially surprising. Though there have been minor debates about Get Out's generic classification, when contextualized through scholarly work on horror, one sees how it is clearly part and parcel of the genre. Kenitra D. Brooks traces especially useful scholarly definitions for horror, such as Isabel Cristina Piñedos, who identifies three characteristics of postmodern horror, a violent disruption with the everyday world, a horror that transgresses and violates boundaries, and a questioning of the validity of rationalism. In Get Out, Chris experiences a violent disruption by the physical threats the Armitage family, whom he visits, place upon him. Their machinations transgress Chris's physical and psychological boundaries. And the twist ending certainly calls into question all forms of rationality. Or take the definition of horror that Brooks privileges, that of Robin Wood, who defines it as, quote, when normality is threatened by the monster or the other, end quote. Chris's normality is certainly threatened by the other, the white Armitage family, when they attempt to appropriate his body and place a white man's consciousness within it in order to create the coagula. Properly categorizing Get Out matters, for Peel intentionally challenged traditional horror film tropes, particularly the marginalization of Black individuals in the genre. For instance, Get Out notably includes a Black protagonist who survives the film. In this way, it rewrites another famous horror movie with a Black central figure, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, whose main character, Ben, fends off zombies for the film's totality only to be shot at its conclusion. As such, quote, Get Out redresses decades of erasure, abuse, cliches, and damaging tropes that have stained horror cinema, Hollywood, and American history, end quote. Indeed, Get Out's title invokes the joke used to, quote, explain the virtual absence of Blacks in horror movies before the 1970s, end quote, which Stephen Torriano Berry relates as follows. Question, why are there no Black people in horror movies? Answer, because when the ominous voice says, get out, we do. Furthermore, Chris's role as the black man in an interracial as a black man in an interracial relationship who functions as a horror film's hero rather than villain also upends traditional horror movie tropes. As Stephen J. Schneider observes, the expectation in a horror film is that an interracial in an interracial relationship, the black man will play the monstrous seductive villain while the woman plays the often passive victim. Chris upends this trope in being neither seductive nor villain. Peel, therefore, creates a more dynamic space for Black masculinity within the horror film genre. Remediation is thus a foundational aspect of Get Out. What would happen, however, if we used it as a framework for reconsidering or remediating Othello? 
Just as Peel remediated the, remediated the horror genre in order to reorient its focus on white narratives and bodies onto black ones, we can remediate Othello's narrative representation into one that no longer raises questions about a black man's humanity, but rather directs attention to the racist inhumanity directed against him through the shifting potent tools of white supremacy. Specifically, by attending to the necropolitics of white supremacy as illustrated by the coagula and by understanding the harm caused by microaggressions, one can recognize how the film articulates a racial framework that illuminates how and why Othello experiences the plot of the play differently than those around him. Ultimately, I suggest Get Out literalizes the horror of, a racial, of Othello's racial experience by stressing the physical and psychological violence against Black bodies and the strategies such as microaggressions that weaken the Black self in order to make it susceptible to white bodily and mental appropriation. Through the coagula, Get Out viscerally confronts modern society's violent appropriation of Black bodies in a way that can help us reconsider Othello's service to the Venetian state and his tragic end. Ta-Nehisi Coates addresses precisely this violence, arguing that the elevation of whiteness comes not from benign activities like ice cream socials, but rather through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land, through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, and various other acts meant first and foremost to deny you and me the right to secure and govern our own bodies. And then they provides a philosophical framing for this social and state sanctioned violence. Building off of Michel Foucault's concept of biopolitics with particular attention to Foucault's consideration of race, he establishes the concept of necropolitics or contemporary forms of subjugating life to the power of death. In necropolitics, in necropolitics, sovereignty comes from being able to, quote, define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not, end quote, which is precisely the dynamic Coates articulates in regard to the way whiteness treats Black Americans. Thus, Mbembe's discussion of necropolitics exposes how, even though not technically enslaved, Black Americans are nevertheless placed in a position of what he calls unfreedom. To account for this modern terror, Mbembe argues one must address slavery in its plantation system. Mbembe's discussion of slavery creates an especially helpful conceptualization for understanding how the horror genre functions as a vehicle for Peel to explore race in America, particularly through the dynamics he highlights with his conceptualization of the coagula. Membe explains that the slave condition results from a triple loss, loss of home, loss of rights over one's body and loss of political status. This triple loss is identical with absolute domination, natal alienation and social death, expulsion from humanity altogether. It is no wonder that Tana Narive do asserts black history is black horror, thereby making the genre an excellent mechanism to visualize, confront, and to try to overcome racial trauma because it can serve as a coping mechanism by helping us visualize allegorical monsters, as well as offering release and lessons on survival and rebellion against seemingly overwhelming forces. And then May's discussion of enslavement as a modern terror further connects to the coagula. In the necropolitics of the plantation, because enslaved people are needed for labor, they are kept alive, but in a state of injury, in a phantom-like world of horrors and intense cruelty and profanity, enslaved life in many ways is a form of death in life because a person's human is dissolved to the point that the enslaved's life can be said to be possessed by the master. Similarly, the coagula and its dependence on the sunken place create Black Americans permanently in a state of psychic emotional injury who wander around the Armitage estate and beyond in precisely the state of necropolitical death in life and Bembe describes. Get out this tacitly acknowledges the legacy of America's racial past while at the same time viscerally demonstrating how it lingers into its supposedly post-racial, at least in 2017, we know way better, well we knew better then and know especially better now, this making um, its post-racial present, this making the film a quote cautionary tale about the monsters hidden in plain sight, end quote. I turn to the first character introduced in the film, Andre, to demonstrate the racialized necropolitical dynamics exposed in Get Out. The film begins with Andre walking at night in what we learn is an all white suburb in a scene that signals the film's insistence on stressing the violence enacted on black bodies. 
In a fairly close medium shot, the camera starts by focusing on Aunt Andre's head, then circles around to his face covered in darkness, except for the small light cast from the street light he passes. And this is a much more lightened up version of what it looks like because I needed you to be able to see. The viewer likely feels as disoriented and lost as Andre does. While he tries to find an address, a car makes a U-turn pulling up beside him. Tension mounts as a lyrics, run rabbit, run rabbit, run, 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 emanate from the car. These lyrics come from the 1939 song, Run Rabbit Run, performed by Flanagan and Allen that centers on a farmer hunting a rabbit every Friday for Rabbit Pie Day. Though viewers may largely be unfamiliar with this unsettling song, its presence positions Andre as the hunted rabbit. Andre responds to the car, parking beside him with a confused, okay. The racial dynamics of the moment slyly suggested by the scene's musical cues, a black man as prey, clarify as he talks to himself coaching. All right, just keep on walking broad. Don't do nothing stupid, just keep on. Andre makes the them versus us tension already established by his being in an all white neighborhood explicit when he tells himself, not today, not me. You know how they like to do mother effers out here, man, I'm gone. This refusal to engage with the increasingly odd situation points to the dangers experienced by black bodies in all white spaces, as well as the ways that black individuals must constantly negotiate this threat, even at the most unexpected times. As Andre turns around to stare at the illuminated bright white car, doors open, red lights shining on the left of the screen in a stark contrast to him shrouded in darkness on the right, a person wearing a medieval style iron mask exits the car, jumps out of the shadows, chokes him out until his body collapses and stuffs him into the trunk as the refrains from Run Rabbit Run play louder. Viewers later learn this is Jeremy Armitage, Rose's brother, who is responsible for the Armitage family's more violent methods of accruing black subjects for creating coagula, again, the white mind and the black body. As we watch Andre's body crumple, unsure whether he survived the attack, we cannot escape the film's emphasis on the violence against black bodies enacted by the hands of whiteness. Andre later reappears as Logan in a moment further highlighting white supremacy's necropolitics. Chris takes Logan's picture in an act of recognition for he identifies Andre and attempts to send photo evidence to his best friend Rod, the process of which moment, momentarily liberates Andre from the sunken place. The camera briefly closes in on Andre's face where his smiling eyes suddenly become wide and shocked as if suddenly awoken and startled. Peel's script in fact describes it as a shift from quote, peaceful expression to maddened horror, end quote. Whereas music drives Andre's first appearance in the film, Run Rabbit Run, immediately after Chris takes the photo, the film's score disappears, directing all attention toward Andre's awakening during which his smile falls and his lips tremble. As he momentarily transforms, he warns Chris, get out. First softly, then again loudly, yelling at Chris while charging toward him. He repeats his plea with urgency, which at this point seems like a menacing confrontation over an unwanted photo, screaming and pushing Chris as he does so. Andre must be dragged away, kicking and screaming. This moment likewise traumatizes the black body as signaled by the nosebleed that accompanies the look of recognition on Andre's face and by the fact that as he screams, Jeremy, his captor, drags him off with his arms firmly encircling and therefore entrapping Andre's body. This pivotal scene from which the film derives its title suggests that once devastated by white hands, the black body continues to be wounded even as the black self strives for recognition. This is Mbembe's death in life writ small, made achingly personal in Andre's devastating warning to Chris and his heartbreaking return to Logan a few moments later. Like all people trapped as Coagula, including Andre, Othello too is deployed in the service of whiteness. Umbreen Dadaboy stresses the dominating nature of this service, arguing his narrative enslavement by the insolent foe and subsequent redemption supposes his free alien status in Venice, yet his commitment to Venice's imperial war signals an obligation to the state that exceeds volunteer or even paid mercenary service. Venice, it seems, can and does deploy him with impunity. Not only does Othello work for a coterie of all white Venetians who order him at will, but as a Christianized Moor opposing the Turks, he also champions Christianity and its function as a force at once civilizing for the converted, yet exclusionary against the unconverted. 
In other words, because the play portrays a contest for power between Venetian Christians and Muslim Turks landing on the side of the Christians, Othello co-committantly stresses the supremacy of whiteness through entrenched associations with Christianity. As Dennis Britton explains, Ethiopians, Moors, Turks, and Jews were duly recognized in the early modern period as figures of alterity, which were made to stand for modes of experience and being that were foreign to normative white Christianity. In his role as soldier then, Othello defends not just Venice, but along with it, whiteness as well. Thus, in civil and interpersonal contexts, Othello, like Get Out's entrapped Black subjects, serves whiteness in both a literal and ideological sense. This is not to say that Othello embodies the suspension between life and death in quite the same way Andre does. However, as a general commanded by the Venetian state sent away even on his wedding night in service of the white state, Othello too is always under the threat of white supremacy's necropolitics. Because of his military service, he has no permanent home called a freewheeling stranger of here and everywhere. That same service means he does not have autonomy over his body, for not only can he be sent away on his wedding night, but his conjugal bliss can be interrupted by the responsibilities imposed on him by his duty. And certainly, Venice determines his political status, for even before Desdemona's murder, Lodovico comes bearing news that Cassio, Othello's military inferior, is the new governor of Cyprus. The stripping of all that makes up Othello's life is clear by the end of the play in lines that signal the negation of selfhood Othello shares with Andre. Othello's occupation is gone, which inevitably leads to, that's he that was Othello, here I am. Like Andre then, the necropolitics of a white dominated society that must ensure its total domination entails an erasure of Othello's subjectivity. Indeed, he believes his very be being here embodying the social death and Bembe characterizes as fundamental to no necropolitics um, becomes literalized in his own self-murder. In addition to illuminating the extent of the supremacy that all white Venetian society holds over Othello, Get Out can also help audiences garner insight into Othello's state of mind and his attendant vulnerability by directing attention to the persistent microaggressions that stress black identity. In the film, a litany of seemingly small occurrences remind Chris of his status as other. A policeman asks for his license after an accident, even though he was not driving. Dean refers to Chris's romance with Rose as a thang and continuously calls him my man. Jeremy comments on his physical strength over dinner. At the party, the Greens discuss Tiger Woods with him, while later Lisa squeezes his arms and pecks, asking, is it true? Is it, meaning sex with a black man, better? And another guest references the fact that black, meaning skin color, is in fashion. These occurrences exemplify the concept of microaggressions. Daryl Wing Su explains that microaggressions are the everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, stubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. In more philosophical terms, Mbembe names these seemingly anodyne everyday gestures nanoracism, a term encompassing daily racist injuries enacted by an institution, a voice, or a public or private authority that deliberately seeks to occasion in them a large or small jolt to irritate them, to upset them, to insult them, to get them to lose their cool precisely so as to have a pretext to violate them. While Mbembe does not delineate nanoracism's various manifestations, Sue explains how microaggressions can take three forms. Those that articulate conscious bias, microassaults, those that unconsciously insult a person's identity, microinsults, and those that invalidate a person's thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, microinvalidations. With this context in mind, one can see that Chris experiences all three forms of microaggression. Whether coming from the Armitages or their friends, these microaggressions marginalize Chris, reminding him of his blackness while fetishizing it. Indeed, analyzing how Get Out deploys microaggressions reveals Peel's attention to their overwhelming effect upon the marginalized person. Peel has Chris move from one racial conversation to the next during the FET so that while he can smile away the initial reference to Tiger Woods, by the time the guest references his black skin, his stony face signals that he has had enough. Microaggressions, quote, can signal a hostile or invalidating climate that threatens the physical and emotional safety of the devalued group, end quote, which is precisely what happens to Chris. Even within the party's short time frame, the film vividly expresses the mental toll microaggressions take upon the recipients, thereby creating, quote, the thesis of the movie, connecting the dots between the subtlest forms of microaggression to the most violent, unimaginable racial violence, end quote. 
Sue notes how microaggressions create four different kinds of stressful effects, biological and physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. Of all the effects Peel stresses, the most obvious for Chris is what Sue characterizes as, quote, suspiciousness toward the majority group, unquote, or stated differently, paranoia, in Chris's case, towards whiteness. The film, in fact, invites reflection on the justifiable nature of Black paranoia through Rod, whose admonitions that Chris has been kidnapped by a white family appear paranoid to the cops he attempts to report to, but instead come across as prescient to the viewer. Thus, the paranoia fostered in Chris by the party proves to be an intense instantiation of the mistrust Black individuals must grapple with daily amidst the dominance of whiteness, a suspicion the film suggests that is not only understandable, but also crucial for protecting the physical and mental Black self continuously under threat. The way racial microaggressions contextualize Black paranoia provides a means of better comprehending Othello's mental state. Almost immediately, Othello experiences a direct microassault from Brabantio as the seething father denigrates Othello for his marriage to Desdemona. By the time Brabantio notes that Desdemona rejected wealthy Carla darlings of our nation for Othello's sooty bosom, his argument turns into a micro assault, for his speech exposes his bias against Othello precisely because Brabantio devalues Othello's social positionality due to his racial otherness. Othello expresses confidence in his services that I have done the seniory, and in doing so, suggests his integration into Venetian society via his role as one of its foremost martial protectors. Your Brabantio attempts to dismantle this integration by contrasting Othello with the men of our nation. It is the language of nationhood before nationhood fully flourished, the our implying an excluded you, an unsurprising tactic given that, as Arthur Little Jr. explains, in the self quote, in the self-preserving instinct of Shakespeare's Venice or Shakespeare's England, a white woman's marrying a black man amounts to nothing less than a violation of national proportions, end quote. As the logic of Brabantio's berating of Othello makes clear, the hour here encompasses him, meaning Brabantio and Desdemona. It does not, however, include Othello. Brabantio's speech in fact, in fact prefigures what will become a prominent colonial dynamic in which those with political power objectify those lacking authority in order to reify that very power. As Amis Serre famously theorizes, colonization equals, equals thingification. This explains the objectifying nature of Brabantio's speech, where in comparison to the darlings of Venice, Othello only merits the status of a thing as thou. By using the familiar thou following thing, Brabantio attempts to discursively solidify his superiority in relation to Othello, thereby reasserting, reasserting the proper social hierarchy. Thus, it is not difficult to suggest that in this moment, we see the genesis of Othello's paranoia, for this is the very argumentation, indeed, even some of the very lines Iago uses in the seduction scene in 3.3 that causes Othello to shift from a man unbothered by other men's praise of his wife to a man consumed by the green-eyed monster. Put differently, Brabantio's microassault not only places Othello in a mental and social position of stress as he discusses his elopement with the Duke, but it also creates the suspicion and racial self-doubt upon which Iago will so insidiously capitalize. Yet even the discourse of positive characters such as Desdemona and the Duke demonstrate, quote, subtle versions of prejudice along a spectrum of prejudicial white views, end quote, or to use Sue's framing, micro insults that expose an unconscious bias, in this case, against blackness. Paying careful attention to the Dukes and Desdemona's respective comments mirrors Get Out's interest in focusing on the racial formulations articulated by those that, at least on the surface, seem progressive about racial difference, such as the neoliberal white armitages. In his well-known declaration that Othello is far more fair than Black, for example, the Duke leaves ambiguity about how to interpret his meaning. For even as he praises Othello, the logic of his rhetoric makes it so that, quote, acceptance is contingent on overlooking or sidestepping the outer Blackness, end quote. Similarly, Peter Erickson explains, Desdemona's claim that she saw Othello's visage in his mind makes his Blackness quote, an awkward problem, end quote. Desdemona speaks these lines when addressing how she would like to respond to Othello's call to Cyprus. She means her speech to communicate her sincere love for Othello and thus her desire to let me go with him. To make her case, she enumerates that her heart belongs to Othello due to his honor, qualities, and personal virtues. But for whatever reason, these qualities do not appear on his literal visage. In this moment, Desdemona subtly invokes the occult practice of physiognomy, which involved reading bodily features, particularly the face, in order to discern a person's character. 
Desdemona suggests that Othello's face does not function physiognomically. It does not appropriately communicate his innermost qualities, which is why she had to turn to the visage in his mind. Thus, both the Duke's and Desdemona's seeming moments of praise for Othello depend on a denigration of his blackness, a denigration that echoes what Brabantio articulated when confronting Othello at the Sagittary. These are then insults passed off as compliments, micro insults reflecting similar yet less obvious biases as those embedded in Brabantio's more blatant racist claims. If read in this way, these moments help disrupt the version of Othello where the savage overtakes the noble Moor's better nature. Or to use the language of physiognomy, it is not that Othello loses self-control so some priorial true self indicated by his black visage ultimately appears. Rather, these microaggressions point to the real, repeated racial stress imposed upon Othello, stress known to disrupt cognition, create paranoia, and foster anger and aggression. The fault for the play's tragedy lies with, at least in significant part, a white society that enacts various forms of microaggressions upon Othello, actions that in turn place the one Black man in its midst under constant strain through its conscious and unconscious marginalization of him. This discussion of Othello reconsidered via the coagula's necropolitics, that is to say through the trappings of horror films themselves newly imagined to comment on race, begs the question, even if one were to reconceive of Othello through the framing of the coagula, what would that mean for the process of adaptation, appropriation, or performance? This leads to another of Get Out's central concepts, the sunken place. When Chris falls into the sunken place, viewers see him floating in a black space as if having an out-of-body experience, staring up at a square, the shape of a television screen, looking at the white face hypnotizing him. According to Peel, the sunken place represents, quote, the systems that silence the voice of women, minorities, and of other people, end quote, as well as, quote, the lack of representation of Black people in film and genre, end quote. How might Othello suffer from the sunken place from systems of silencing and limited representation? More pointedly, to return to the issue of perspective, how has the dominance of white producers, directors, and audiences all influences upon the play's representation on stage and film, as well as the influence of white dominated professoriate who does not speak for Othello as Ian Smith so movingly argues. How have all these predominantly white perspectives limited how we interpret and in turn depict race's role in Othello? Peel created a transformative artwork because as a black director and screenwriter, he asked a white person to see the world through the eyes of a black person for an hour and a half. Here we once again see the importance of perspective. This is not simply about telling a black story as important as that is, but is also about telling one in a way that privileges a point of view other than the white male cisgendered one so prominent across American culture. In other words, Peel rejected the universal in favor of the particular. Perhaps then understanding Othello anew means rejecting the idea of universal Shakespeare, for a universal Shakespeare is actually often a white Shakespeare simply and falsely positioned as raceless. The framework provided by Get Out demonstrates the power of a very similar story understood through a very different racial point of view. At the same time, it spotlights the importance of a voice willing to advance that retelling. Those of us who study, write on, teach, and engage with Shakespeare can collectively work to be part of that voice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was amazing. We really, really appreciate your being here and sharing that work with us. Um, we have a question, and that question comes from one of my students, which is so exciting. Um, so this question, uh, is a question about um, Othello's epilepsy. And um, the student is asking, what do you think about epilepsy as the explanation for Andre briefly regaining consciousness in connection with Othello's epileptic seizure? You know, I think that that's a really interesting question. Um, and that probably shows my own perspectival issues because I hadn't really considered Andre um, as having an epileptic, uh, uh, the, 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 that being an epileptic moment, um, in part because 
There are other moments in the film when the other characters, right, they respond to this sort of awakening. Um, and, and so I think that's really interesting, but I will say that I think that, um, I'll think about it a little bit more, but I do think that whatever is happening in the film, if you were to characterize it in that way, um, it's a little bit different than it occurs in Othello. I think I worry about the ableist, like, and I've been thinking about this a lot more lately, the, the ableist perspective that that also brings to bear, right? So then Othello, it's like the cause for this is some sort of disability in Othello and a disability that only he has in this play, right? And that, you know, um, people have said, well, well, maybe he's seen it, but they've seen it before, but we don't really know. We have to take a liar's word for it. And so, and so, you know, I think that, that I, I want to be careful and think through it a little bit more and not use epilepsy as a reason for kind of justifying um, Othello's behavior, because I, I don't want to be reorienting and reiterating the kind of ableist trope that's there. And I think that um, some actors were talking about this in the Exploring Othello 2020 that the Red Bull Theater hosted, and the way that that just like the rolling of the eyes and the chewing of the lip and the Desdemona murder scene, and like him having an epileptic fit earlier is actually incredibly problematic, both in terms of race and in terms of ableism. And so they won't perform it that way. They're just, they just won't go there. Not all of them did. One of them talked about, um, Jessica D. Williams talked about how she leans into it, um, but several others, so Keith Hamilton Cobb, Peter Macon said, I wouldn't play it that way um, because it's problematic on multiple levels. So I'm not 100% sure I'm answering your question and saying that they're exactly, like how are they related? But to say, I think that they, that you want to be, we all should be careful about just if, as we need to be careful about sexist tropes in Othello and about racist tropes in Othello, continuing to think about ableist tropes and also how those enhance otherness and difference when they're put in kind of intersectional conversation with one another, right? This is the one black man. Oh, and he's also the only one who seems to have this uh, dis disability. Yeah, thank you so much. I, it shows the urgency, as you're saying, of intersectional approaches and, and the work of someone like Justin Shaw, who's who's thinking about the intersection of race and disability. Um, I encourage anyone else who has questions to please submit them to the Q&A. Um, I had a related question um, that came from our class discussion yesterday. As we were thinking about the, um, the fact that Chris is a photographer, and it seems that what um, aspect of his his body is is fetishized or um, desired here is his eyes um, and the the blind character. Um, and so we were thinking about the urgency of a disability studies framework for that aspect of the film, and how that might connect to and critique discourses of color blindness, whether that's in the post-racial discourses that Peel is critiquing or in our own field of Shakespeare studies where people like Ayanna Thompson have been um, challenging the notion of colorblind casting, for example. So is, is sight and seeing something that you've considered in your work on this film? Yeah, yeah. so in the longer, in the longer version, like thinking about sight and seeing in multiple levels, um, about where is the camera directing attention, right? How are close-up shots being used or disorienting shots being used? I think is really important because when Peel says that he asked white people to, through, to see through the eyes of a black person for an hour and a half, he like means more than one thing, right? I think it means seeing through his eyes as a black director in a genre where typically that is not the case, right? Um, to see through the eyes of Chris, right? As the protagonist, um, to see the eyes too, like thinking through the dynamics of um, the entire film and the thematics that it's asking you to think about. So I absolutely think that sight is really important because one of the things that Peel has said about the film is that, you know, he started, he said initially the film was going to be about post-racial America. And then he was like, by the time the film got done, it was like the cat's out of the bag, right? Um, but he starts writing it in, a, in that kind of post-racial America moment. So Post-racial America is a fantasy, but some, you know, between 2008, when President Obama gets elected for his, for, you know, for the first, um, for his first four years, and then the, then 2016, where everything, um, 
that was already a problem just starts to blow up spectacularly, right? So, you know, for those of us who reject post-racial America, it was never not there. But you mentioned colorblindness, and I think that's really important because in addition to colorblind casting, um, we need to think about how to tell stories that are also not colorblind, right? So it's about colorblind narratives and colorblind perspectives and points of view. And like, I think that's really interesting at the beginning of the film when the camera shows all of Chris's photography, right? It's not universal, it's very particular, right? It is a particular aesthetic. It's all black and white, right? It's looking at um, black experience in the, in America in like really interesting and multifaceted ways. Even though it's very quick, right? So it's a dog or kids playing in a fountain, right? It's not the story of suffering that he's about to experience. So it gives a kind of dialectical perspective about Black American experience. Um, and so I think perspective is really important in multiple ways, right? It challenges us to take a new perspective. It challenges that colorblind perspective that's not just about casting, but also about how you tell stories and how you are always thinking about race and that things don't necessarily, like I, I said the other day, like a hoodie isn't just a hoodie, right? So students at Notre Dame who are predominantly white can wear hoodies and it's fine, but we know Trayvon Martin couldn't wear a hoodie, right? A hoodie's not just a hoodie. So this is the same thing with narratives, right? You have to think about how something's gonna function differently, right? When a character is a character of color um, and predominantly white audiences might be addressing that. So I think perspective and, and um, points of view are actually really, really important, obviously on multiple levels and aesthetic ones as well in the film. Thank you. Um, we have several questions um, and I'm going to combine two of them, um, which ask about women and femininity. But in particular, we have a question about depictions of white women, both in Othello and in Get Out. Um, so the, the question is, you know, could you, could you offer us your thoughts on the depiction of, of white femininity in, in both of those, the, both the play and the film? I think that in Othello, white femininity is certainly presented as more sympathetic, right? I mean, so Desdemona is loving and also sometimes not very interesting depending on which lines are cut and how she's performed and who's cast in that role. And, you know, at the end, she becomes a sort of martyr figure. And, and whether one finds that compelling, because sometimes people like darker, more interesting women, that is still a very sympathetic version of white femininity, right? You can't talk about this play without thinking about the role that white femininity has played for a really long time um, as this kind of bastion of like racial purity um, and what needs to be protected. And so obviously that's playing a role in Othello and gets heightened depending on who's cast in, in that role. In, in Get Out, right? white femininity is, is much less sympathetic by the end of the film, right? So she is, Rose is part and parcel of the whole kind of Armitage family trying to, she, she is, it lures people in, right? Um, she may not use Jeremy's methods, right? Her methods seem to be more kind of seductive, if you will, um, but she's clearly part of it. But what I think is really interesting what I've written about elsewhere is the way that even then people try to kind of give her an out. So Alison Williams, the actress said this in, in several interviews that people would be like, well, surely she was brainwashed too. And she's like, no, she's just bad. And then people are like, oh, well, she's just fearful of her family. And she's like, no, she's just bad. She's just bad. And the film makes that super clear. You couldn't be clearer, right? Um, and she said that it was almost always along racial lines. It was almost always white people trying to justify you know, why this Rose character would be this particular way. And so I think that that's really important to be thinking about that, you no, know, even when we, when creators and artists work against the sympathetic white femininity that I think is inherent more in Shakespeare's play, that it is something culture so desires and wants to recuperate, that it is important to kind of push back and see how white femininity has been and can be and continues to be complicit in racial oppression. What is the book? Um, they were her property too, right? Is right. It about very... white white women enslavers. Yes, right. So this is long standing and continues to be. <laughs> right. Think about white women voting for President Donald Trump, right? So white men, you know, white femininity needs to be put under a microscope along with other um, other forms of oppression. 
Thank you. And, and the second question that's on, on femininity is, um, do you think that Black femininity plays a significant role in Get Out? Most of the victims shown in the film are Black men. Does that make a difference to the racial politics? I think it does, because you have the one, so you have these, you have the two Black women, one who's a specter, right? Chris's mom, who's referenced multiple times and she's died in this tragic um, accident and she serves as this kind of psychic trauma for him, right? And then of course, um, the woman who is Rose's grandmother, grandma, right? And she says at the end, right? Um, so I think that there is significant, I think that there are two things. There's significantly more attention on Black masculinity. And I think that there has have been appropriate and thoughtful critiques about, for example, right, that you see um, Rose's, the, the one Black woman, like her body is destroyed, right, because it, it, Rose's grandmother inhabits it. Um, but then, of course, in the end, Chris is choking Rose, but he doesn't actually kill her, right? And so people have said, look, is this a cop out? Is this just a moment where he just can't go that far and kill the white woman? Um, and so I think that that's a critique well taken. Um, and so I would say that one, I do think that because just the sheer number and because of perspective, again, you are focusing more on black masculinity in the movie. And two, there isn't I think a significant attempt, though I'm happy to dialogue and, and, and hear a, a, an alternate point of view, to differentiate the experience of Black femininity from Black masculinity in the film, right? All the coagula get destroyed in some way, except poor Logan, who's like off with his, you know, the woman who, right, um, he's now married to, um, but the, the ones on the Armitage estate. And I think that that's really significant. And so I agree, I think the film could probably do better in, in that regard. Thank you. Um, this question um, came up in my class yesterday, so uh, I thought I'll ask it to you now. Um, do you think that there's a specific character in Get Out who functions as Iago? Yeah, I think Rose is Iago. I think you have like a, an Iago collective, right? But if you're talking about who's trying to seduce, who puts on to more than one face, right? So like that moment where she's talking to Rod on the phone and she, so she's talking and she's like, ah, and then she's like, goes cold blank. And, and Rod like clearly notices she is, this is too much, right? Like she is, this is beyond. Um, I think she is Iago, right? She does not wear her heart on her sleeve. It's hidden for a long time. She is like, Iago's like, I, right? I am what I am. Like you, she, she's that same way. She seems emotionless in, in, in significant moments and can turn things on and off. Or like when she's like, okay, just give me the keys. Right. And then like it changes, like the kind of on and off um, is incredibly Iago like the seduction of Chris. I don't mean necessarily sexually, but I mean, I think the undertone is there, but I mean like convincing him to stay when he first wants to go, oh, it's going to be all right, right? She even seems to be on his side. Well, like, let me prep you for my parents, you know? Um, and so I think she's probably the Iago figure, but there is of course, like I would say an Iago collective because all the Armitage family and their guests are participating in this form of racial violence and suppression. So like they're all Iago and also kind of Venice too. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I want to give um, credit to my my student Aaron Cha, who said yesterday that um, Rod is the Iago if Iago were actually Othello's friend, and if he if he actually had a friend who advocated for him, right? Um, and and I know that others have said about Get Out that you know, or the differences between Hamlet and Othello. I'm thinking about Ian Smith saying, you know. Othello doesn't have a Horatio to, to tell his story in the end, right? So I thought that was such a clever, a clever take on um, the remediation, the possible remediation of Othello that you've talked about in your work. Um, so I think we have time for one final question because we got started um, a little bit late. Um, I want to ask a question um, because you talk so much about the remediation of the horror genre. Um, one of my students is asking a question, how, how do you think the difference between tragedy and horror as genres affect the depiction of race in these stories? Do you think maybe the framework of horror allows Jordan Peele to tell a story in ways that are impossible using the framework of tragedy? Oh, that's an excellent question. I mean, I, 
I think there might be some blurred lines between horror and tragedy um, because right horror is this kind of more modern conceptual conceptualization but when you read early modern tragedies they are also horrific right so bodies piled on top of each other and wax hands and right you know bodies hanging from trees and tongues cut out and all sorts of stuff and so you know when you read or watch Titus is that not also kind of horror and so I think sometimes the issue is that um, tragedy thanks to Aristotle thanks to others is kind of this highbrow classy classy right and I don't I don't like these kind of false distinctions but it is kind of this even compared to comedy right it's serious and it's about important people and about important things and if you think about the idea that tragedy was originally kind of considered to be this thing like homage like what is the what is everyone releasing well I think it goes back to kind of maybe presumed audience right because if for so long and, and I want to be really clear because I don't want everything to just be like about oppression. BIPOC artists have long found ways to make their voices heard, even when they've been silenced. At the same time, because artistic power has so long been in white hands, especially white male hands, but not always, right? Is there an investment in having the audience feel homartia regarding race? Probably not. And so horror is a space in which because of its very nature as like this whole debate about like, well, was this a comedy? Remember with the Golden Globes? Was this a comedy? And I write about this in the chapter um, or horror, right? It's a way of like recuperating the genre, but it gave Peel freedom, I think, to do things that he wanted to do without having to worry about this being like a drama. That drama is I think what we would call now tragedies in the early modern period, like drama, like this kind of highbrow, it's gonna get the Oscar type of movie. And I think that that horror gave him a sort of freedom, right? Um, to tell this sort of story in a way that um, dramas don't always and then dramas also have the kind of the weight of like, well, what dramas get told? Well, are they always stories of enslavement? Right? Are they always stories where, right? And so I think that there, that, that to, to just reiterate, because it's a complex question, I'm like mindful of time. One, I think there are false dichotomies between tragedy and horror. And two, I think that horror gives some freedom again, because it doesn't have to, it, it doesn't have to. I think Peel's film blew it wide open, but it doesn't have, right? Think of, um, mm, oh my goodness, Parasite, also a horror film, goes on to win the Oscar, but it blows it wide open. And so I think it, it allowed for some freedom to think about not only remediation, but also race in unexpected ways um, because producers aren't gonna be as worried about a film made on that budget as they are gonna be about a film made on a $20 million budget that needs to get Oscar clout, right? Get Out was a pleasant surprise. And so I think that that worked in his favor and hopefully encourages future artists to be as brave and production companies, right, to allow this. And then also my point is for Shakespearean theaters and adapters and appropriators to, to be braver too. That's such a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for this really wide ranging lecture that illustrates exactly what I said at the beginning of this event, that um, your work is remarkable in its scope. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the book and um, my wonderful students will have a chance to talk to you some more tomorrow. So I've copied and pasted the questions that didn't get answered into a document. So we will be able to talk about them some more tomorrow. Thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I hope that you'll consider joining us on April 21st for a book launch and discussion about Dr. Ruben Espinosa's forthcoming book, Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism. I hope you have a restful and safe evening. Thank you so much.